Good evening, or depending on where you are, good morning. I'm John Levin, I'm the Dean of Stanford's Graduate School of Business, and I'm delighted to welcome you to the first event in this year's Stanford China Economic Forum. The forum is usually an annual event that's jointly hosted uh, at, by Stanford through the Graduate School of Business, the Stanford Institute for Economic Policy Research and the King Center for Global Development. And this year we've gone virtual for a series of events this fall. The forum was created to bring together scholars, business and organizational leaders and policymakers to promote dialogue, an open exchange of ideas and to foster collaboration on questions concerning the roles that the United States and China play in the global economy, as well as in areas such as innovation, education, health, and geopolitics. This year, with both of our countries beset by the COVID pandemic and with heightened attention around immigration, issues of immigration, national security, and economic coupling or decoupling, the need for open dialogue is even greater. And today's event around business and business education will touch on a number of those uh, themes. To begin uh, the program, I'm delighted to introduce Stanford's president, Mark Kesse Levine, to welcome everyone and to say a few words. Great, well, thank you so much, Dean Levin. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome all of you to this year's Stanford China Economic Forum. Uh, this is our third annual forum, and it couldn't have come at a more important time. This has been a remarkable and unpredictable year with huge implications for US-China relations and for the societies and economies of both countries. Although I wish we were all together in Shanghai as we'd originally planned, I'm glad that we're able to meet even virtually. Uh, the Stanford China Economic Forum is critical to advancing dialogue and collaboration between Ch Stanford and our partners in China. Uh, the challenging moment we currently face makes this project more urgent than ever. I'm grateful to all of you for joining us to share your expertise and your insight into the critical issues facing our two countries today. Uh, I want to spend just a few minutes discussing the state of US-China relations and why ongoing engagement with China is so important to Stanford. Now, when we last convened this forum 12 months ago, none of us could have imagined the difficult year that lay ahead. In China, the US and around the world, COVID-19 has affected nearly every sector of society, from healthcare and education to the economy and industry. Communities have gone into lockdown. Businesses have closed. Education has gone online. And global travel has slowed as we've contended with the virus. Managing the pandemic has required international collaboration in public health and scientific research. As Stanford researchers turned their attention to COVID-19 this spring, knowledge from China proved crucial to understanding the most effective strategies for containment and mitigation of the virus. But despite the benefits of cooperation, we face rising tensions between our two countries over the pandemic, trade, immigration, international security, and more. In higher education, tensions have largely revolved around intellectual property concerns. This was true even, even before the pandemic. Policymakers are particularly concerned about the potential misappropriation of intellectual property. Universities have a responsibility to attend to these issues, and we do. But it's also essential that these concerns are handled in a way that preserves our ability to collaborate on important research. Another area of concern uh, that affects the Stanford community is immigration policy. Stanford has promoted intellectual and cultural exchanges with China for decades. Today, Stanford has more than 1,000 students from China, as well as many scholars. Their unique perspectives and ideas enrich and inform our campus community. It's deeply important that we continue to bring students and scholars to Stanford from China and from all over the world. The flow of people and ideas across national borders is essential to driving the innovative solutions that our world needs. That's why Stanford will continue to advocate for immigration policies that promote the free exchange of people and ideas. The fact is that in this moment of challenge and uncertainty, it's more important than ever 
that Chinese and American students and scholars work together both to seek solutions to import, important problems and to improve our understanding of one another. Uh, when I traveled to China two years ago for the first Stanford China Economic Forum, I was amazed by the spirit of innovation that was evident everywhere I went. At the Stanford Center at Peking University, the open exchange of ideas between Stanford researchers and their Chinese counterparts was evident on everything from health to geopolitics, economics, and more. It was clear how important these collaborations were to all parties. But I was equally struck by the strong relationships that had formed between American and Chinese students and scholars. Despite our political challenges, these relationships, built on mutual respect, trust, and a spirit of collaboration, can provide the foundation for a productive path forward for our two countries. The work our scholars produce together will generate concrete benefits, which can provide an important counterbalance to geopolitical tensions. This will be crucial in the years to come because the major crises we face, like COVID-19, transcend our borders. From health to climate change, to poverty and inequality, the challenges of the 21st century are global challenges and they will require us to work together. As I look to the future, I've been thinking about the other great challenges we face and the lessons we can apply from this experience as we work to solve them. There are two lessons in particular that I think will transform Stanford and our contributions to the world in the long term. The first is an increased focus on accelerating the application of knowledge. When COVID-19 reached California in the early spring, Stanford researchers rapidly pivoted to deploy our resources to respond to the medical, epidemiological, and societal dimensions of COVID-19. Members of our community worked effectively and efficiently with external partners to develop diagnostic tests and hasten trials of possible therapies. Outside of healthcare, we also had researchers working on insights and interventions to improve remote education, reduce the spread among incarcerated populations and much more. This model of accelerating the application of knowledge has promise across countless fields of research. I believe we can work together to amplify our contributions and drive new large scale sustainability solutions to the challenges we face. The second way that I think our university will be fundamentally changed is through this intense experiment with moving our operations online. From remote education to telehealth to work from home, faculty, students, and staff have found new ways to study and work this year. The opportunities that this provides to make education and healthcare more accessible long after COVID has subsided have tremendous potential at Stanford and beyond. The challenges we face are difficult, but I believe that working together and making ambitious plans, we can create a better future. Now, before I close, I wanna thank the organizers of this forum from the Graduate School of Business, the Stanford Institute for Economic Policy and Research, and the King Center on Global Development. I'd also like to thank the faculty members, members from the Freeman Spogli Institute for International Studies, as well as those from other departments and institutes who have contributed to the forum. These meetings and the exchange of ideas that happen here are essential to advancing glo global progress and that of our two countries. So thank you for making this event happen even in this difficult year. And thank you again for being here to share your insight and your wisdom. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Well, thank you very much, Mark, for those comments to start the evening and to give us a sense of Stanford and the year we've been through and where we're headed and the state of US-China relations. I think that's a perfect lead in to tonight's uh, conversation or this morning's conversation. For this event, I'm delighted to be joined in discussion by two uh, distinguished fellow business school deans. The first is Ann Harrison, who's the Bank of America Dean at the Haas School of Business at the University of California, Berkeley. Her background is in international trade, global labor markets, and policies for inclusive and sustainable economic development. The second is Hongbin Kai, who's the Dean of the Hong Kong University Business School. He was previously the Dean of the School of Management at Peking University, and among other things, is an expert on the Chinese economy. And Hongbin, I can't help but mention to start the evening, uh, uh, a 
something that happened earlier this week, which is that your advisor and my Stanford colleague, Paul Milgram, uh, won the Economics Nobel Prize along with his advisor and Stanford Business School faculty member, Bob Wilson. And um, so it was, it was really an auspicious week for us and uh, it makes it even nicer to welcome you to, to this event. Yeah, indeed, it's, uh, it's just a great, wonderful, right? The, um, and congratulations to Stanford as well. This really speaks to the great tradition of Stanford, Stanford Business School Economics Department that you know, we have uh, uh, long traditions of excellent, outstanding economic research as we talked early, dating back all the way to Ken Iroh and many other great uh, scholars. So congratulations to you too, but this is just wonderful. And it, their, their prize, by the way, it really speaks to what Mark said about uh, the accelerating the application of knowledge. They won the Nobel Prize for developing auction theory and then applying it to the world. And for anyone who's listening to this event, if you want to just a small piece of unmitigated happiness during the pandemic, go to Twitter or YouTube and find the video of Bob Wilson ringing Paul Milgram's doorbell at two in the morning after <laughs> Stockholm couldn't reach him to tell him he'd won the Nobel Prize and, and saying, Paul, wake up. You've won the Nobel Prize. It'll put a smile, I guarantee you, it'll put a smile on your, on your face. Okay, so now I wanna open the, the, I'm gonna open the discussion with a few questions. We'll also be taking questions from the audience. Um, we're gonna to try to cover a number of areas. We're gonna, hoping we're gonna have a discussion about the, uh, some about the pandemic, the effect the pandemic's having on our institution, some of the lessons learned, what the longer uh, term uh, effects might be for business and business education. And then I wanna broaden the discussion to talk about US-China relations and some of the big uh, social and, and business issues that are going on in, in both of our countries and really excited to hear your thoughts on all of those things. L let me start off with, with the pandemic, it's hard to ignore. Uh, and you know, it's been an extraordinary disruption for all of our, our schools. Um, and let me start with you. I, you know, how, how has the last year gone at Berkeley? How are you thinking about the, the, the coming year and, and you know, what's it gonna look like? Thanks, thanks, uh, Jonathan. First, I, I just want to thank you for this opportunity to be here today, and I want to congratulate you on your Nobel Prize winners. Um, I'm also happy to report that Berkeley had two Nobel Prize winners last week uh, in chemistry and in physics. So this is a wonderful, a wonderful group of schools to be associated with. So getting back to the uh, the pandemic. Well, last March, I remember it very well, the middle of March, it was a Tuesday, and I received the news that we had to go from all in-person instruction to all remote instruction on Thursday, 48 hours later. And within 48 hours, every single professor at the business school went from teaching in person in the classroom to remote instruction, mostly via Zoom. Um, it was amazing. Um, it was a very challenging shift. I would say it was more challenging, not for technical reasons, but really this move away from an in-person experience where as a business school student, you network, you meet people, you, you get to know your fellow students, you meet potential employers. I think it's removing that social engagement, which is really was the most challenging. The first thing we did was increase communications, written communications, in-person Zoom meetings through town halls. Um, and then we developed a set of guiding principles, in particular, instructional resilience and emerging stronger. In the longer term, over the summer, we, what our big focus was taking the basic Zoom experience and upgrading. It, going from instruct, educational instructional resilience to instructional excellence. Um, and some of the things that we did, and I'd be happy to talk about this more, is we invested in instructional designers to, uh, to introduce simulations into the classroom, to introduce a more engaging way of teaching students. We also transformed a number of classrooms 
into virtual spaces, virtual classrooms where students are in panels and monitors and instructors feel like the students are in the classroom, even if they're not. Um, so these are the, some of the things we did. A lot of it involved faculty redesigning their courses to take into account um, the need for student engagement. I'll stop there. Uh, Hongbin, how about, how about you? Do you wanna say a little about how the year's gone? Then I wanna ask both of you to talk, have a little, some discussion about what, what might stick and what might change as a result of the, of the pandemic. But go, Hong, maybe tell us a little about just how we're the state of the world and for you. All right, so um, we are similar to, you know, what Anne said and many others, I, I probably including Stanford, where, you know, as the pandemic hit, we have to really move uh, the uh, teaching to remote teaching and then gradually watching the situation and then make uh, different plans. So uh, currently what happens here is that given the uh, pandemic situation in Hong Kong on relative terms, uh, I think Hong Kong is, is doing okay. Uh, we have uh, single digit cases uh, for this wave. Somehow people call this third wave in Hong Kong. And this is about uh, when it started uh, one month before uh, the uh, school year started. So uh, we decided to do online for the first three weeks. And then uh, late September, we started to offer a hybrid model. So uh, the, uh, for the students who are in Hong Kong, who are willing to come to classroom, we're gonna do the in-face, face-to-face uh, -face teaching uh, with social distance and all the other precautions. But at the same time, online option is open all the time to all students. So this facilitates some of the students in Hong Kong and some of the uh, mainland students and international students, they uh, come to Hong Kong, do 14 day quarantine, and they are able to uh, have uh, uh, in-classroom in uh, learning experience. So this is basically where we are. For the last year, uh, in addition to the pandemic, we actually had uh, some big shocks to teaching and learning environments early on, starting from last year, end of last year. So the social uh, movements in Hong Kong actually already forced us to make lots of changes. Uh, the first semester, you know, the, the fall semester started off last year, started off with uh, students' class boycott. And, and then over time, the movement sometimes become more violent and there was com uh, campus disturbance. So in November, we already moved to online teaching, hybrid teaching. So in some way we've been doing this for longer than some of you guys. But this is what uh, we uh, basically what we went through for the last year. And this is where we are. I, I How about you guys? I well, I I want to come back to make sure we get back to the social disruptions in Hong Kong and, and mm -hmm. some of the parallels in the U.S. and in, in terms of social mm -hmm. disruption. Oh, you know, Anne, your, your, your point about adaptability resonated with me because that was exactly our experience of, you know, the, if you had asked uh, a year ago, was it possible for a school to transition all of its teaching online over a weekend, create a new quarter with new classes over two weeks, reinvent an entire year over two months, design new summer programs and executive programs in a, in a matter of uh, uh, weeks and months, I have events like this one, I obviously would have said, no, that's just completely impossible. I mean, we're at a university, we move slowly, we, we, take, we need committees for a couple of years and then votes and it, it's just unthinkable, and yet we've done it, and it's it's kind of remarkable just to see how adaptive and nimble faculty can be when uh, when asked, and 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 when the need is there, and and people have to engage in forced innovation, and and students as well, and staff, and and the whole institution. It's it's really extraordinary, actually, uh, what what all of us in peer schools have 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 gone through and and, and accomplished so far. Let, let me ask the two of you. I, I'm curious your thoughts about, you know, and Mark already alluded to this, but the opportunities from online acceleration and all the experimentation that's going on and people having new ideas about teaching and online education programs, just connecting people around the world in events like this one. What, what do you think is, is 
we'll start with you or start with you, Hongbin. What, what do you think is most likely to, to, to stick from this experience or what opportunities are most likely to open up for, for our schools? Yeah, I, I, I think um, the question uh, also really depends on how long this lasts and then how long we really sort of get so used to the, the new model of teaching, learning, research interactions. Uh, but I, I, I believe some of this will, uh, will stick, will have a long-term uh, impact. Just uh, think about the, the forum we're in now. Uh, this is just a wonderful in terms of getting people together from all around the world, different time zone, different, you know, different countries to have a focused uh, discussion for, uh, for, for, for this forum. And this, uh, uh, you know, if all of us have to fly to uh, Shanghai or to San Francisco, right, the, uh, the planned organization will be totally different scale. So uh, why not doing some of that, even there's no travel restriction. So in the future, I think some of these kind of uh, interactions will, be, uh, will, be, uh, uh, will still stay. People will love this. And then uh, the, uh, in terms of teaching, the, some of the technology uh, and the teaching method, remote teaching method uh, will be uh, still uh, be used in the future to provide uh, different kinds of interaction, different kind of access, and a more effective uh, uh, way of bringing people from different parts together, and also offer certain students more flexibility. So what I, what I find here is that the, um, some of our part-time uh, MBA program, executive MBA program, um, some of the students are uh, located all over the places. They all have very busy schedule. And if we have a fixed schedule for teaching modules, they usually plan a year ahead to try to make it. But the whole world is changing so fast. Business face so many challenges. More and more students feel like sometimes they have to change their schedule, but they, want, they don't want to miss many classes. So we, technology like this will provide uh, you know, additional option for people who need flexibility. And the, uh, this is the same thing for certain interactions, exp uh, exponential learning, uh, you know, remote uh, interactions with different groups of people, uh, peers, uh, lecturers, uh, the, uh, uh, even entrepreneurs uh, from different parts. So uh, I think we'll increasingly see uh, the mix of face-to-face -face, uh, interaction with the online learning teaching interaction. This is not to say that the the current model, the, the past model of face-to-face -face interaction will be, uh, will be gone. I think those will still be the core, but the new things will add lots of value to the, uh, to the old way. So that, that's my, uh, my take. How about you, Anne? What's, what, are your, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I, I mean, I agree with Hong Bin. I think that a lot of these lessons are really here to stay. I think we're never going to go back to the old reality, including going to the office every day, right? I mean, before this idea that we could work at home, even two days a week was unheard of at Berkeley. And now our head of human resources is saying this will be our new normal. Um, I think nobody, certainly in the business school, thought that they could so easily transition to a remote teaching model. We talked about it for years. Um, and then we suddenly saw we could do it. And so right now we're doing exactly what, what Hongbin suggested, which is in our evening and weekend program, our working professional program, we're actively working to create a new remote option, um, which will allow students to attend Berkeley um, without having to fight the Bay Area traffic or without having to get on a plane from Seattle or from India, from Indonesia, which actually some students were doing in order to attend our evening weekend program. So that's, that's gonna be a game changer for us. Um, the same thing is happening as in a, our executive education program. Uh, it was all in person before, and now it's all digital. And this happened in the space of what, seven months? And so those digital options, those remote options, will will survive and will develop into a whole new way of 
of interacting. But there is one really important lesson to me. Um, it's still not a replacement for being in person. Um, that's that's an important lesson and kind of an auxiliary lesson, which I never thought in a million years would be the case, which is that it's not the case that more is better. We find that students really prefer smaller classrooms, particularly in a virtual setting. So this idea of we're gonna to move to these large classrooms with the star professor and thousands of students, it's not happening. The smaller the classroom, the more the student engagement and the more effective the class is. So that's been a very interesting lesson, very counterintuitive to what I would have thought. That's very, that's a, those are very interesting points. I think we've certainly seen the same, the, the, some of the enthusiasm for virtual interaction you know, through events like this and, and, uh, and also through things like we do a fully online asynchronous uh, program, the LEAD program, which is a year long program. And the, the number of people signing up for that has gone up so stratospherically during the, the pandemic um, that it's been, it's been really, uh, it's been really striking to, to see as people have come, come to the realization and to see some of the power of, of doing uh, virtual learning, online learning and there was the wave 10 years ago, but now to, to get it in the second wave, it does seem like it's an inflection point. I, I will say to your point though, and it, it's, I, we really miss in-person interaction. I, the students, the faculty, our staff, everyone. I, just the, the visceral uh, desire that people have to connect and, and be with each other and it really is a. It really has been, in some ways, a reminder, actually, of how important the classroom experiences, the research discussions that happen in a hallway, the the serendipitous collisions where relationships get formed and, and ideas get get generated, and you know, it, it's sort of an affirmation of the business model of residential education, even as we see the 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 positives uh, opportunities of all of this uh, virtual interaction. I'm, 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 uh, and I'm, 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 we'll pick up on one more thing about what you said about the less is, the less is more. It, what if you say a little bit more about that in terms of if you, if you imagine virtual programs in, in the future, do they, people often talk about scale economies and do you just think those are not there from virtual education? Because how do you think about scale in, in, in online or virtual education? I mean, I think what seems to be evolving is that, that there's two components, right? There's the um, there's the asynchronous component, which is pre-recorded, which is often what's called evergreen content. So the theory of relativity, things that don't change over hundreds of years, that part can be looked at by many, many people, right? At that, that their scale, right? But then there's the really important critical component, which is quote unquote synchronous, where you're interacting with a faculty member or you're having some sort of experiential application or simulation. That part is really critical for bringing education to life. And that part, the smaller, the better. I was just on the phone with one of our alumni who has started, who has a nursing school um, it's called the Nightingale College of Nursing in Utah. And they have identified that in nursing, which is very hands-on, you don't really you want to have one faculty member to eight students. And I forgot to mention the entire school is a virtual school, right? They they work on on they work on these like um, uh, dummies, right? Mannequins that are mailed to their house, right? They never go to school. Everything's virtual eight students to one faculty member, right? So that's kind of the extreme. Normally it's 25, but, but I think for, for kind of experiential uh, interactive learning, you want small classes, but for the evergreen kind of stuff that never changes, then of course you could have the, the very large classes, but you need both to make education truly engage, engaging and effective. I've been curious for your thoughts on, on that one. Yeah, so uh, we have uh, a variety of programs starting from uh, undergraduate special uh, master program, MBA, full-time, part-time, EMBA. 
So I think uh, just to uh, relate to Anne's point, uh, what I heard is that it really differs. So for you know large undergraduate class or special uh, specialized math programs, some of these lecture, uh, the teaching format is usually uh, mostly lecture style. In that sense, then the uh, you know you you have 80 students uh, you know log on and they can still ask questions through uh, the chat room, but not necessarily just you know shouting to each other in classroom. That's that's the scale effect. So 80, 90 doesn't make huge uh, difference. 60 all the way to 120. But when you come to smaller MBA executive MBA class, uh, people do value very much the uh, interaction and the chance they can get you know their questions answered, their views heard. Uh, in those cases, I think the uh, the scale effect will not be the, the relevant uh, factor where the intensity or the chances to participate become more important. In those settings, even in online classes, uh, smaller class probably encourage more uh, the uh, in, uh, interactions virtually. Um, I, but I don't know whether, so sometimes I wonder whether this difference also has um, something to do with the, uh, the generation difference where the undergraduate special master program tend to be younger generation, where they, you know, they born, they, they grew up online interaction, that's very easy for them. Where some of the executives, you know, 40 something, right? Then uh, for some, you know, this is, this is relatively new to their younger generation, uh, uh, younger generation students. So I wonder it's also like habit uh, of the students but I do see uh, Anne's um, observation that you know some it's not all scale. The uh, online teaching is not about all, all scale. The MOOC style, especially in a business business education setting. Your, your point about the age difference is is really interesting. I think in that, um, of course, you know the the students who are coming to business school today or undergraduates today have basically grown up in an online uh, medium and, and they're completely comfortable with it. It's, there's no transition at all. It, it strikes me that one of the things about going through this, this experience with COVID is that everyone else like us who might never have adapted to be completely comfortable just interacting virtually all the time, have been, we've all been forced to do it. So we, now in some sense, everyone is, is, has, is, is, is becoming to some extent comfortable in in doing Zoom meetings and being engaged in a in a virtual space almost exclusively, and that may be one of the reasons that we get an inflection point in the potential for virtual engagement and and virtual learning and education, not just at the undergraduate level or business school level, but throughout lifelong learning throughout the the, the, the for, for people of all ages. I want to switch. This was this was interesting. I want to switch a little bit to a different aspect of uh, of what we do at business schools, which is which is a, and relates directly to U.S. China relations. And actually, before I do it, let me also say to the audience: if you want to put in a question through the chat, you're welcome to do that. You can just type it in, and then it'll uh, it'll be moderated and it'll come up uh, for to be asked potentially. Um, so the pandemic has, you know, arguably has really accelerated a growing divide between China and the U.S. And uh, we have a lot of Chinese students at Stanford and has a lot at, at Berkeley. You send a lot of your students over to the U.S., uh, Hongbin. I, I'd love to hear your thoughts on, you know, is the U.S. going to continue to be a desirable place for Chinese students to study or to look for academic or business jobs? Yeah, I, I believe so, uh, especially for, um, you know, top schools like you guys, Stanford, Berkeley. I think if uh, student, Chinese students uh, get offered to go there, um, they're still very eager to go and their parents will be as uh, supportive. Uh, the uh, question uh, is, it's not on the preference or design, it's the constraints. And uh, the constraints do seem to be uh, become tighter and tighter uh, in terms of uh, student visa, work visa, and the uh, other sort of um, 
to our perceived um, uh, constraints or you know the uh, difficulties, and so this um, certainly will you know in our economics term, this is really uh, it, it will have effects on the the real demand is how many people can really make it. Uh, I think the effects will be in the short term will be stronger on the uh, not so uh, no not the, the, the very top schools because uh, then the um, you know the really top schools I think around the world there are no substitutes for for it you know the uh, for Chinese students who are looking for international education U.S. Canada U.K. Australia those are the uh, the, the basic choices in terms of countries. And obviously the US, uh, both in terms of uh, quality, quantity on the top, uh, you know, top end market, it has no, uh, uh, no alternative. But I think if you go down uh, uh, lower, um, those options, uh, given the dif increasing difficulties uh, people see uh, coming to uh, going to US, uh, people were more actively looking for uh, other alternatives in other places. So, uh, so yeah, I think the desire that the uh, the preference uh, is still there. It's still very attractive, especially for top U.S. schools. But it may be more getting more difficult to get there. What do you think, Yan? Are you what? what how do things look from Berkeley? Um, well, obviously, Berkeley really, really values its international students, and and we seek the best and the brightest. Um, and we, we welcome them with, with open arms. And one of the things that I did as first things I did as Dean was to make all of our programs um, STEM designated um, so that it could be easier for foreign students who do come to Berkeley to be able to get um, work permits and work experience. And we continue to do everything we can to make it attractive for international students including holding some hybrid in-person instruction in order to satisfy uh, current US um, restrictions. I mean, I see universities all over the world as, as really seeking the best and brightest students. I, I really think that universities and the research and the, the education that we, uh, we provide serves as a, a cultural melting pot within society. And I expect that to continue forever um, and we'll do everything I can to ensure that. Um, in the long term, I, I would like to make an analogy to international trade. I'm a trade economist and in international trade, there's this phenomena called cross-hauling. Cross-hauling means that you see two-way trade in the same product. So China exports Volvos to the United States um, and the United States exports, I don't know, Ford to China or uh, Germany exports Mercedes to China and China exports cars to Germany. So this kind of cross hauling is what I would expect to see in the long run with our students attracted to great schools in, in Asia, like your school, Hongbing, and, and the reverse happening as well uh, as we benefit from all these uh, differences across these wonderful schools. So let me, I wanna push you a little on that. I love the analogy to, to, to the, having the bilateral flows that uh, develops over time, particularly with the rise of, of stronger, stronger business schools and, and universities in, in China and Hong Kong, which, is, which has been a defining feature of, of education over the last 10 or 20 years. So it's a natural prediction, except if we look at what's happened in international trade over the last, certainly over the last year, it seems to be going the opposite direction. We seem to be going in the direction of decoupling less, maybe less flow of goods and services, decoupling of technology uh, platforms and, and, and the like. Is that gonna, ha, what do you make of that? And is that gonna interact, you know, how will that interact with the flow of people? Yes, thanks for that question about trade. So uh, in order to really do this question justice, unfortunately, I need to go back to the 2007-2008 crisis. So before that, we had 100 years of trade. And let's think of trade as exports plus imports and GDP, right? The share of trade and GDP going up for 100 years. 
In 2007, 2008, the last really big economic crisis had a fall in that. So that long-term trend was disrupted. And it's interesting to see what happened afterwards. For the US and the rest of the world, we essentially had a V-shaped recovery where trade went back to where it was and continued to go forward. So trade and GDP in the US was about 30% pre 2007, 2008. It was 30% before this pandemic hit. And the WTO is actually predicting for the US and the rest of the world, initially they thought that there would be a huge decline in trade. It was estimated to be like 10 to 30%. But now they're actually estimating, you know, we're already seeing recovering, things are going back to normal. The one exception, interestingly, is China. So China, it did have that fall in 2007, 2008. The share of trade and GDP was 60%. It went down to about 30, so about half, and it's never really recovered. In fact, trade and GDP has been kind of declining ever since. So to me, that is the more interesting puzzle other than the rest of the world, which is basically recovering and I expect it to recover. Clearly the fact that these two countries have imposed 20% tariffs on each other is not a good thing. Um, I don't think it's good for the world. If you want my 30 second solution, I think we need more programs to compensate the losers from trade at national level and at the international level I think we need multilateral organizations like the WTO to intervene to make sure that global trade continues along its merry way as it has for the last hundred years. Very quick. I, I love it. That was a lesson in, in international economics. Hongbin, how, how about uh, what, what's your what's your take on the, the business relations, economic relations between the U.S. and China right now, and are they going to re reverse and and get go back in the direction of uh, of coupling? Yeah, you know, as the real experts, um, you know, I'm just a casual observer, but uh, I think it's still worrisome at this point of time looking at the U.S.-China relation in general and then the uh, business uh, trade relationship in particular. Uh, the, um, it obviously depends on many factors. I think no one knows the answer. U.S. Uh, uh, election coming up in two weeks and then the, uh, uh, the uh, domestic politics uh, involvement afterwards and then the, uh, you know, the thinking uh, of U.S.-China relation um, in the national level, and uh, that's on the U.S. part, and there are many other factors. And then there's also on China's part, right? How the, uh, does the Chinese government think about uh, long-term China-U.S. Uh, China relations? You know, what uh, um, they will try to do in terms of uh, the uh, relationship, what their strategy, short-term and long-term. So there are just so many uh, different uh, factors uh, I don't think you know it's easy to predict what's going to happen. But to me, uh, lots of these factors, lots of the things we see, lots of the events we uh, uh, we saw recently, uh, really uh, make me quite concerned about the uh, the trend of this relationship in general, uh, and then the uh, trade and other aspects as well. Yeah, what, you? What, what, what do you think? Well, well, I have to say, I, you know, on the first question about uh, immigration and flows of students, I, you know, I, I think I share both of your enthusiasm for the, you know, certainly for U.S. institutions, places like Stanford, to bring Chinese students and students from all around the world. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it's, it's just a, it's just a great thing. It's a, it's a great thing for, for for our institutions, because it creates a, a much better learning environment for everyone. There's just so many more opportunities to be exposed to people from different cultures, to get different ideas, and it's exactly what education is about. And, um, and it's a great thing for the country, because many of the Chinese, our Chinese students who come stay in the US and they start companies or they, they help build organizations, and that really benefits the US economy. And the ones who go back to China they take with them a sense of knowledge and understanding of the U.S. that's really important for improved relations between the countries. So 
I, you know, I think I, I share that enthusiasm. I have anxiety concerns now about, um, you know, the, the sense on the part of Chinese students in the U.S. and Chinese faculty, for that matter, that they are uh, under scrutiny in the U.S. Um, and, and there are, you know, there are reasons why U.S. Research, you know, researchers at U.S. institutions, for example, have come, come under scrutiny for having research programs in China they didn't disclose or, or for around intellectual property. But somehow that, that um, what should be sort of a narrow consideration about individual behavior has expanded to, to cast a you know, broader shadow on Chinese students. I worry a lot about that, that we, we need to create a really welcoming environment and make it a uh, 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 you know, place where people would really want to come. Um, there's a and there's a question for you from the in the from one of the audience members, which I, I'm going to ask you, which was uh, came to me, which is about the pattern of growth in the China economy. And the the question is about this this issue of China's trade not recovering after the last recession, which might be indicative of what might happen in the future. And the question was, couldn't that be couldn't that just be a function of the fact that over the over the last 10 years since the, the great, the, the 2009 recession, um, China's transition to being much more of, a, of an innovative economy, having more of their own internal consumption and so forth, and less of an export led uh, growth economy. Well, well, absolutely. I mean, that, that's the equivalent, right? If you're exporting less, um, then you have your they're they've been growing very rapidly so clearly domestic consumption has taken up the 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 bulk of that kind of an interesting question is is why did that happen and is that um is that a good is that a good way to go in the long run because so much of growth i believe comes from being more uh exposed to international competition so the fact that there's been a pullback, um, very syst systematic pullback, um, makes me a little bit worried, I'd say, about um, things like productivity. Um, so we see a decline in, in efficiency or productivity growth, and, and I wonder if that could be one reason why we're seeing that. But it is true that the flip side of, of less international consumption of Chinese goods is more domestic consumption by that has to be the case. Although I'm encouraged by what we've seen during the pandemic, which is that there's been tremendous growth in trade of products that have helped countries fight the pandemic. I mean, I have I cannot tell you the number of masks that I have personally received coming from Asia and all sorts of other goods that have really helped me personally. And we are seeing a lot of PPE and a lot of of support in this difficult time when Asia has fared, uh, certainly um, China and Hong Kong and have fared so much better than the United States. So in, uh, uh, another indicator of you know, where things might be going is, the, is where our students are all going to work. I, I, so Hong, I'm, I'm curious if, are you, if your students' aspirations are changing at all as the result of the pandemic or you know, in particular, if they were thinking about coming to the U.S., has their desire to work in Hong Kong versus China versus maybe to, to, to come here changed at all when you look at where they're going out to get jobs? Yeah, uh, I, in terms of where to get jobs, still the, uh, you know, I don't have a very good statistics. Uh, just uh, from, you know, uh, talking to our students, uh, this is a very tough job market, I think, almost everywhere. Uh, the, uh, so uh, students are still in the process of getting used to this, um, this extremely challenging job market. The uh, Hong Kong uh, economy uh, is in, um, you know, it's in quite deep trouble for many different reasons. Basically, there are all sorts of negative shocks all happening at the same time. So the job market is particularly tough. The uh, China, um, especially cross border of Hong Kong, Shenzhen is actually doing very well. So the innovation uh, industries, the high tech firms, the financial institutions um, 
on relative terms, absolute terms, I think these, they are the, this is, center is the bright spot. So quite many opportunities there. Um, so many students, in particular the mainland students, but many, some of the other Hong Kong international students would love to have jobs in Tencent, for example, it's just across the uh, Shenzhen River. Um, in terms of going to the US, I think for now, uh, I don't have, um, I haven't heard many students uh, thinking actively planning to uh, find a job in the US, but because the the news they hear, uh, or the news we hear from this side every day is the H1 visa is reduced. Trump made another speech saying that no this, no that. So uh, that actually discouraged students seeking jobs uh, in the US. Uh, but job prospect, job uh, uh, sort of destinations, uh, I think it's too early to tell. Uh, one thing we saw interestingly is that the students um, coming to Hong Kong, coming to Hong Kong, you know, to our school, had this V-shaped uh, 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 bounce since the early spring. And so the most of our programs, some of the programs uh, we see almost double the, uh, the admissions applications from previous year, because the, uh, in the short term, at least in the short term, students really looking for the best option for international education, as we talked earlier. And some of the options that used to be attractive to them are not available anymore. So uh, now they uh, come to Hong Kong. So we see the short-term shift. Um, in terms of school education and jobs long-term, I think this is still yet to see. Any sense in yet about how the what's going on now may affect the career trajectories of your students or what they might be looking to do after they graduate? I think it's too early to tell. I One thing that has been really impressive to me is before the pandemic, we were seeing um, a relaxation of applications. So applications had slowed down. And since the pandemic, since uh, round two or three last year, we've seen an acceleration in applications to our business programs. In our evening and weekend program, applications went up 50%. And uh, this fall with the next round, uh, already round one of the MBA process has come in, um, as well as our undergraduate apps, our applications are all up. So what that's telling us, combined with the fact that salaries are at the highest level ever for people finishing business school, what that's telling us is there's still quite a robust demand, very robust, in fact, increasing, I would say. Um, although, of course, there is a deceleration of international applications. In terms of where students are going, um, it's hard hard to tell at this per point. Um, what we do see is an increasing demand for what I call MBA plus. So people getting an MBA and then deep doing a deep dive with a joint degree into another technical degree. So a lot of students are interested in our new MBA master's in engineering. So you can get a more technical degree at the same time. There's a huge interest in the health industry. So a lot of students are doing MBA and a master's in public health. Um, and the other thing that we're generally seeing, and this is I'm sure true for both of you, is much greater awareness and concern for social, environmental, racial, and economic justice. And students going to business school who don't just want to do well, but they also want to do good. So let's pick, let's pick up on that last point that you- Actually, John, that you, maybe we should turn it to you and ask you what you're seeing. Well, it's actually, um, it's pretty similar to what, to what the two of you have seen in the sense, certainly in, the, in, in terms of uh, people, the desire to come to business school, we're, we're, we're also seeing, um, after having a, a bit of a decline the last two years in our applications, we're, we're seeing a resurgence uh, in applications and, and they may end up being our, our it could be end up being our highest uh, ever actually this year. It's hard to, a little early to tell. Um, 
but um, and on the way out, I mean, one of the things that happened when the pandemic hit last year is, of course, the job market was very challenged, and and we were very fortunate because we're a small school, and and actually many of our alumni uh, stepped up to to create jobs that were uh, good landing points for our students. Um, I thought there would, might be a big fault in entrepreneurship. We typically have about 15% of our class start companies right out of the business school. And I thought there might be, a, students might be more risk averse in a, in a situation like this and be looking for more stable jobs, maybe, maybe going to more uh, consulting firms or, or, or companies that where you knew you had a landing point, or if you were an international student, you had maybe more assurance that you weren't vulnerable to, to visa uh, risk and, and so forth. Um, and in fact, we didn't see that. We still saw lots of students going to, to smaller uh, companies, to uh, lots of students uh, doing uh, entrepreneurship and starting new ventures, in fact, higher than the last few years. Uh, and so that was, that, was, that was surprising and we're gonna keep a close eye on it this year. It's a little early to tell what this year's class because we're still early in the year, but um, those were sort of the, some of the things that we've been keeping our, our eyes on in terms of the, the job market. We also, I think, see a, a very strong rise in interest of our students in, in just being, um, thinking really hard of, as they look at their careers and look at their jobs about um, not just how they're gonna be professionally successful, but about, um, what, what's the purpose? What's the purpose of this organization that I'm going to? What's the purpose of this career? What is the impact I'm going to have on the world? Um, and going through a you know, global crisis like this really causes you to focus hard on questions like that. And I think that for many of our students, that's that's been exactly the process they're they're going through. And it's we're trying to meet them there in terms of the education that we're providing by giving them more opportunities at the school to really think hard about their leadership and how they're going to become leaders for society, uh, as well as just great organizational leaders. So that's, you know, I think that's something we were doing anyway before the pandemic, but the pandemic has given just even more momentum and, and urgency to make sure we, not just the pandemic, actually, the pandemic plus things like the Black Lives Matter protests in the spring and the rise of awareness of all of these inequity issues in California, the fact that California is on fire and, and we're breathing smoke all the time. It makes you think about climate change and sustainability a lot. So those issues, those social issues have all been really top of mind for us. It, I have to imagine that at Berkeley, the sim similar things are true. That is correct. Um, one of the defining leadership principles is question the status quo. And so it's true that we've been thinking about these things for a long time and that this is Berkeley after all. So um, happy to talk more about that, but, but I'll, I'll yield the floor to Hongbin. Hongbin, how have these issues played out for you? And actually, I'd also be just curious about, I mean, how this feeds into something you mentioned earlier about the disruption from the protests in, in Hong Kong. And how do, I mean, as a school, how do you manage that when there's just societal disruption at that scale? Um, what do you do? How do you, how do you think about that in your educational mission? Right, so uh, yeah, uh, indeed the, um since last year, the social um, unrest has, uh, you know, affected society as a whole uh, in uh, many different ways. Um, Hong Kong U, um, obviously, as a, um, the uh, university with longest history in Hong Kong, uh, is uh, involved, is affected uh, one way or the other. Um, direct impacts to the business school is not uh, very large. So the uh, I talked to so one thing we do is that we really want to engage the uh, students and stakeholders. So I talked to students leaders uh, last term, uh, you know, this, in the fall, in the spring, see their concerns and then try to address uh, their questions about how to balance uh, all the different factors while they maintain the uh, learning, um, keep on their learning going. 
And the, uh, on the faculty level, we also engage in communications, have meetings about, you know, how do we uh, conduct our teaching research in an environment like this, where people, you know, even among our colleagues, people can have quite different views. Uh, overall, I have to say, I'm very proud of the uh, uh, students, alum and faculty members in my school, where people, uh, no matter their political uh, views, uh, mutually respect each other, uh, very professional in terms of teaching and research. So, um, so, so, so I think that's, uh, that's basically the, uh, how the business school has, uh, has been doing, has been affected in the social uh, environment. But there's a general larger question uh, in terms of, I guess this is uh, also part of your question is, in the sort of environments like this, uh, as business school or as university, um, one is how do we respond? The other is how do we proactively think what we can do? I think the, uh, uh, in Hong Kong's case, the, um, um, this, it is very complicated situation and Last year, sometimes things get very ugly and very violent. Uh, but I, my personal experience that I never been really feel uh, any threat to my personal safety. And on campus, I've been here all the time, even when the students occupy the campus. Uh, you know, I took a walk uh, on campus. I never felt, you know, uh, my personal safety was ever threatened. And there's also a perception that, you know, Hong Kong in general, the society uh, hostile to people from mainland. And uh, I've been here for more than three years. You know, I just had a wonderful relationship with my uh, Hong Kong uh, colleagues at different level, you know, admin, faculty, and you know, university leadership. So um, I think there's a uh, like perception from uh, different parts about the situation, but there's also the fundamental uh, uh, elements of factors in the society. So uh, the, um, but indeed in a situation like this, given the perception, given, given everyone has their very strong belief about certain things, I think universities have a bigger responsibility creating an environment, creating a, a, a community where people can mutually respect each other and here in Hong Kong, there's people talk a lot about and, you know, academic freedom, especially in light of the uh, national security law. Uh, but I believe the university uh, can do a lot in terms of, uh, you know, have a very solid foundation about certain principles within the university, have uh, bring people together from different backgrounds, different views, students, uh, faculty members, uh, alums and other people. And the, uh, once this um, environment or this culture become more and more solid, where most people are on board, then uh, this, can, um, this, this can have a bigger uh, impact to the society serving as a role model, how different views, different backgrounds, different uh, uh, ideas can coexist nicely and the people actually enjoy having a diverse uh, uh, views, diverse backgrounds. So, uh, I think the U Hong Kong U is working on this where uh, the uh, university leaders, the deans are having forums with stakeholders, faculty members, and thinking about how do we make Hong Kong U such an environment, but we certainly have a long way to go. Right. Hongman, I'm so encouraged to hear you talk about that. And, you know, I think that's, it's wonderful. It, you know, even, even in the U.S. and Ann and I are in California, where the the formal protections around uh, academic freedom and free speech in our state are very, very strong. They're essentially the First Amendment under a California law called the Leonard Law. It, but yet, the the challenge of creating an environment on campuses where where you know everyone can come, they can feel that they, that it's a welcoming place for them. And they can feel they they can speak up, they can state their mind. People are going to listen to them. They're going to engage with them, and they're going to do the same for the other people, even if those people are disagreeing with them. It's right. it's hard, and it's hard in a you know for us, it's hard in a country that's very polarized. For mm -hmm. example, right now by the election and, mm -hmm. and other issues. Um, so it's it's great to hear that you're 
wrestling with those issues in 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 Hong Kong and and trying to make progress. And I I, I know we, you and I have talked about these issues before. I'm curious. Mm -hmm. It curious me about these issues, but also just generally how you feel you're navigating all of the, the social issues from the last year, the issues around racial equity, and, and how you think that might change your school. Sorry, is that directed at me, John? That was to you, yeah. Oh, okay, um, well, I that's a broad question, um, but I did want to talk a little bit about um, what we've done at, at Haas to, to uh, address racial justice, if I may. Um, so we've made a tremendous amount of changes uh, at, at Haas. Um, we, for example, we increased the diversity of our MBA classes. 38% uh, of our American students are, are minorities, um, which is a very, percentage by by most business school standards. Um, I hired a chief diversity equity and inclusion officer who reports directly to me. I broadened the admissions criteria so that what you do for diversity is is a is a factor. I doubled scholarships for diversity candidates and I reduced the frictions for applying for scholarships. I changed staff hiring practices. I increased the diversity of our faculty. So we hired 10 faculty this year. Five of them are women. Um, and I uh, diversified our advisory board and, and our alumni council. Um, so we created a more representative group of staff, students, and faculty, but that's not enough. Um, we've also rolled out enough for a number of initiatives to kind of change the mentality. So one of the things that I'm very most proud of is that we're, we just revamped our core curriculum and that'll be rolled out next fall. Um, it hadn't been, our core curriculum hadn't been reviewed in 17 years. And we did a couple of things. We doubled the amount of required work on data and data analysis and statistics. So we increased um, the data requirements, but we also introduced a core requirement where you have to take a course on leading diverse teams and creating a more diverse and inclusive environment. And that required course will address things such as unconscious bias, right? A lot of bias that occurs is, is not deliberate. Right, somebody walks into your room and you would you interview them for a role, and you don't even realize what you're thinking or what you might think about whether this person is qualified for a certain role, and so just being aware of that is really really important. So we've we've done some things um, which which I think are important and um, and but we have a lot further to go and and we're very working very hard on that. It's great to hear you talk about that Anne and I think that's you know, it's one of the I, I found that in, just in talking to to many fellow deans around the country the the collective energy that all of our schools in the, in the US have uh, around these issues right now and the commitment that that uh, we have to to fundamentally, in a sense, changing the institutions in terms of the representativeness of the students, the, the faculty, uh, staff, and, and, and really having a, a focus on being inclusive institutions, more inclusive institutions than we've been historically uh, through all these different ways, through, through fellowships, through uh, admissions, through the curriculum, through co-curricular activities, through focus on job placement, working with our alumni, and then the impact on the world through working with with business in different ways. Um, it's 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 you know it's a, I think it's a great exciting thing where we're not really in competition. We get to sort of be in in collaboration and and information sharing and idea sharing mode uh, because we're we're all headed in the in the same direction in a way that will benefit uh, ultimately benefit the country in a in a significant way. So loved hearing all the things you're you're doing there. Um, uh, okay, we're, we're I'm, now I realize we're just about at time and I've got to some of the questions from the audience, but not all of them. So I apologize to people who I didn't get to the questions. 
I want to give Hongbin and maybe first and then Anna, I want to give you a chance just to give a couple of last remarks and then I'll, I'll wrap up. Go ahead, Hongbin. All right, yeah, yeah, thank you. So, so, so this is a, a truly uh, exciting uh, events, interesting discussions. I am, um, I'm very encouraged by uh, the present and then, uh, uh, you know, Zhang and Anne, uh, you guys commitment to uh, uh, keeping the international collaborations being open to uh, academic uh, students uh, collaborations across uh, China and in the US. I think the uh, obviously given what happened in the last year, we all realized the world we're living in has changed and it's gonna change further. So I think it's increasingly important, uh, almost vital for, uh, for us that the, uh, we should have a stronger uh, community of people who have uh, the uh, similar vision of what a better world is. You know, for those of us who believe the world should be one world uh, with different peoples coexist and then a mutual respect. And obviously there are other people, in, uh, you know, think that the future world should be, uh, you know, a, 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 a collection of fighting tribes. So, uh, so I'm very encouraged by, you know, what this event is, uh, is about, uh, about what you said. And at Hong Kong, in Hong Kong U, this is a very truly international place. Hong Kong U is truly international university. So I'm really looking forward with you guys, with Stanford community, with the larger community that really want to continue to build the uh, stronger collaboration across the Pacific uh, uh, Ocean, despite all the different difficulties and challenges we face. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anne. Uh, thank you. Thank you again for this for this opportunity. Um, uh, Berkeley Haas was founded over a hundred years ago as an east facing school, right? Uh, the goal was to increase collaboration with the east and and that continues to be very important to us. Um, I personally do a lot of research um, on Asia. I very proud of my collaboration with uh, Justin Ifu Lin. Uh, who's, a, who's a dean at Peking University, and I'm very happy to be on, on one of his boards. Uh, and, and so I look forward to more collaboration. In fact, the last time I was in Hong Kong, I, I was being told constantly about the fact that there are two greater Bay Areas, right? There's the one, <laughs> and of course, there's, there's the one there, which I visited. Um, but um, I guess my, my kind of the message I, I'd like to leave us all with is that uh, that, that the area um, that we, we us as three deans, we are so love, lucky to be in the most innovative parts of the world ever, right? The, the two Bay Areas, right? The two greater Bay Areas. But that innovation will not lead us anywhere without inclusion and, and sustainability and preserving the earth. So that's certainly my focus uh, as a dean at Berkeley Haas to create a more innovative school, but also to make inroads on, on inclusion and sustainability. Thank you. Great, well, thanks to both of you. And just I wanna say a few things in closing before I do, I wanna say, I. I actually didn't know that Berkeley was founded as the business school was founded as an East Coast facing school. Mm -hmm. Stanford Business School was founded for the opposite reason, which it was founded by Herbert Hoover in 1925. And the founding, the, the, the argument that he makes in the, the founding letter to the Stanford trustees was that too many Californians were leaving for the East Coast and we needed to start a business school for Californians so they would stay in California. We were actually a very insular business school to start, which I think makes it, you know, I guess sort of all just shows the transformation that now we're having a, a China event and a, uh, that's a, of course a, we're we've become a very global institution in so many ways over the over that trajectory of 100 years. I, I just finished by I'll wrap up by saying first of what a pleasure it was to just get a chance to talk to you. It was so much fun and uh, to hear your thoughts. You know, it's been it's been such an unusual and uh, in many ways difficult year. And you know, both the 
the pandemic and the fact that we've had to shift online and adopt technology and, and, and organizational change in ways like never before. And to go through all these social upheavals different in the in our in our respective cases, but but profound uh, in our case around issues of of race and, and inequity, and in Hongmin's case, uh, Hong Kong China uh, issues, and it's, it's such a complicated time to navigate. So it's just been so interesting to hear your thoughts about both of those uh, changes we're going through and how they might affect business schools in the world more more broadly. And I think in, in navigating a year like this, there is a, a tendency because you have to focus so much just on getting, keeping things running to be a little bit insular and to, to, to lose sight of the broader collaborations that we have that we value so much. The, the, and uh, really a pleasure to get to renew those tonight and to think about how things are going differently across the San Francisco Bay and going differently across the Pacific Ocean and um, have a chance to share this discussion. So thank you very much. And thanks to everyone in the audience for, for joining and for asking questions. Uh, this is the end of the first Stanford Economic China Forum. We will have two more later this fall. The next one uh, is it will be a week after the US election. It's gonna be hosted by Mike McFall uh, professor at Stanford and former ambassador to Russia, who's now written a recent book on China. He will be talking about US-China relations and geopolitics. And then the third event will be hosted by the Dean of Stanford's Medical School, Lloyd Minor, and it will be about health issues and the pandemic in the US and China. So thanks everyone for joining and have a good uh, evening or day, depending on where you're located. Thank you, thank you, John. Bye bye, Anne. Thank you. See you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Thank, thank you. you very much. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.